Hello, everyone. Welcome to Automating Victory. I'm so excited to be here with you all in Japan here together. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, first of all, very sorry. I've had a cold, a cold this past week, and I'm fine now, except for my voice. So please be patient with me. Uh, but yes, I'm John. I uh, grew up in the US, uh, born in North Dakota, went to school at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And a year or so ago, I came to Henge to work as a software engineer. You might have checked out our booth. Highly recommend it. And uh, last year, I spent some time making a Python script that can automatically beat a favorite in-browser video game of mine. In this talk, I'd like to talk about some of the tips that it, uh, I found helped me along the way, introduce you to some cool and useful I.O. libraries that you might like to use in your own projects, and uh, also tell you about a cool video game. Does anybody here like video games? Okay, bad news, we're not actually playing the video games here. We're making a script to do that. Uh, let's talk about that game, though. Mama no Sweeper was originally released all the way back in 2010 as a Flash game by developer Hojamaka Games. He released an Android port in 2015 and finally updated it to HTML5 in 2016. Uh, it's a bit like a Minesweeper and an RPG, where instead of mines, you have to watch out for monsters. But unlike Minesweeper, where clicking the mine is an instant loss, you can click any unrevealed monster at or below your level. And then you'll beat it, get some experience, and reveal the tile. Level up eventually, and you can uh, beat higher level monsters, reveal more of the board, and beat the game. Unfortunately, if you guess wrong, and you click on a monster that's too high level, you'll lose hit points and eventually lose the game. Like Minesweeper, the number on an empty tile is a clue as to the neighbors, but unlike Minesweeper, it's the sum of the levels of the surrounding monsters. So here you can see that it's the level three because it's next to a level one and a level two monster. Of course, there's other options. Those other options are where the complexity of the game really comes into play. For example, that same three could come from three level one monsters, a level one and a level two monster, or a single level three monster. And each of those has combinatoric possibilities. So if you add them together, you wind up with 120 compared to Vanilla Minesweeper's 56. Feel free to check my math. In one sense, this game is a lot harder than Python. But in another, it's a lot easier. Because if you're level three, and you see uh, three with n no empty tiles around it, you can safely click all of them to reduce the overall uncertainty of the game. And that push and pull between whether it's easier or more difficult comes into play in the various difficulty modes. These change the density of monsters, how many it takes to level up, and the spread of levels to give a very dynamic game. Difficulties range from easy all the way, uh, all the way up to huge X extreme. The dev's description, yaranai hou ga e, or you're better off not playing. And the game is fun, I recommend it. Uh, every time I've gone to a PyCon, I play this game on the flight over because it's very easy, very fun. Bricks my phone, replayed it all except for that last level. We'll talk about that. That last difficulty level is more challenging than anything because you can only click empty tiles. And if you make a single mistake, you lose instantly. I have lost hours to failed runs of this game. Uh, usually I lose maybe after an hour or so either due to a careless click, bad math executing the strategies, or just bad luck. It's straightforward to play this mode, but executing them perfectly for an hour or so, that's hard. But you know who doesn't have a challenge doing math and input-output for an hour? Well, Python, of course, and I'm in software. This is a solvable problem. So I laid out a very straightforward roadmap. I would make a script that could do what I do, only better. I could look at the board, turn it into a numerical model, use the same strategies that I use, make those moves, and then I repeat until I win or lose. So with the roadmap in mind, I did nothing for about three years. And I don't think I'm alone in having projects like this. Uh, there's some cool idea you, know, you want to implement, but just all the work to get there 
kind of turns you off from the whole, uh, the whole situation. I'd like to talk a bit about the solutions that worked to get out of this pit for me. First off, this is actually a straightforward roadmap, but it's pretty challenging. Luckily, there's an easy fix where you just do the bare minimum. You take a minimum viable product and you reduce it until it's as minimal as possible. In this case, just answering the question, where is the game board on my screen? Can I find out? And the answer is yes. It's fairly straightforward even. Two well-known libraries that I highly recommend using. MSS takes very quick screenshots and then OpenCV to actually locate the board. You might use OpenCV in any number of computer vision topics. It's very powerful and I'm just using the barest amount here. But it essentially lets me ask, where is this target image in the whole screen? And I got results in an hour of tinkering. They weren't good, they weren't quick, but they were results and I could iterate on them. Of course, I don't want a picture of the game board. I'd like a numerical model with things like, is there a number in the field? Have I revealed it yet? Something we can use for math later. But even this is kind of a tall order for an MVP. Let's just start by trying to parse the level number. It's static, we need to know it anyway, and it'll help at all phases of the project. Simpler problem, makes projects on the process progress on the whole thing. Of course, we'll want our solution to generalize. Maybe we look into machine learning. Optical character rec uh, recognition is a well-known field. We aren't doing that. We're just going to match the pixels. It's, uh, compare it with the references, since there's only 35 values to choose from there. And that gets us a function. It's not perfect, only works on single digits, but there's room to iterate again. And iterate we do. Uh, we generalize to apply to each of the grid locations, check it for double digits, see if it's filled, empty, all by modifying an already working function. Easier to debug when it starts off working than trying to get it up to speed. So we get the model, we can consider strategies, and the simplest one that I found was to click randomly. Don't care about what you're actually going to win, just make sure that you can pick a number. After all, every game starts out with a random click anyway. Speaking of clicking, the library that I use to handle that end of the automation is PyAutoGUI, and it is very well known, it is very powerful. It lets uh, Python scripts send arbitrary keyboard or mouse inputs to your computer. Great stopgap for any weird problem that requires human intervention at some points. Oftentimes it lets you cut out that same human intervention. Uh, and the best tutorial I have found by far is Al Swigert's fantastic book, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. You can look it up online, he's published this chapter for free. Highly recommend. And with that, we have a fully functional MVP just by looping through the steps that we've already taken. And even though it's a terrible idea to show live demos, I can't resist at least trying to show you what this looks like in practice. Everybody, cross your fingers for me. Hey, there we go. Oh, wow, yeah, it does not do a good job. It's randomly clicking. This is, uh, if it wins, it is by accident. Uh, but, you know, that kind of ignores the, oh, safety video. Don't need that, thankfully. But that ignores all the successes along the way. This is either a terrible way to play a video game, or it's a bunch of really cool automation techniques that just haven't quite finished there yet. I find the second mindset is a lot better for personal projects and maintaining them until they grow into something you like. Of course, we're not done. I do want to revisit that simple strategy I hinted at earlier. And that strategy uh, is that if you see a number at or below your level, the adjacent squares can't contain dangerous monsters. So those red boxed can be at most one. It's very quick to do, something that you would do while playing. And pseudocode might look like this. Check out every row, column. If that number's below or equal to your level, go through every neighbor, add it to some safe to click set. And it's fine code, like this would work 100%. But Python is notorious for not liking nested for loops. 
and this didn't really leave me satisfied when I came to this solution on my way. Uh, but it'll work, so why spend time optimizing something that'll function? I mean, I care about it, in short. It was my original question when I set out on this whole journey that I wanted to make something that could implement my strategies and do it well. Uh, and that brings me to the second takeaway from this, that you can't waste time by learning. And optimizing something is a great way to learn. NumPy, for me, is one of those fantastic tools that shows up everywhere, but is a little intimidating to crack into. If you haven't used it, it does array and matrix operations very fast because it's all vectorized under the hood. Uh, it, of course, it's easier to learn it one function at a time to solve a specific problem. For example, can we just go through every grid and column location to find if it's less than or equal to the level? And the answer is yeah, uh, because NumPy stores things as a vector, it can determine whether it's above or below the level at all times, roughly in parallel. And then you can simplify the for loop, but we aren't satisfied with that because there's still a nested for loop. And then the question becomes, can we do something, for every, depending on neighbors, for every place in a grid? And if you're like me and have a little bit of background in computer vision, that sounds like numerical convolution. And this is not a talk on numerical convolution. There's so much cool stuff to get into. Uh, just gonna go over the barest overview. You slide a moving window called a kernel over a grid, multiply the kernel by the uh, underlying grid, and then add the results together. Uh, Scikit-learn has a great function for this that plays very well with NumPy. And of course, because this shows up in image processing and machine learning, a lot of really smart nerds have optimized this stuff, so it's blazing fast to use. So the question is, can we use this for the process we want? And spoiler alert, we can. What we do is we start off by doing that vectorized check as to whether a number is above or equal our level, here symbolized by highlighting those squares. So that's a Boolean array. And if we slide a kernel that adds the neighbors over this array and add it, we'll only get a number greater than zero if it's next to a grid with a low number, those blue squares on the right. So if we put that all together, we start with that vectorized check, go for the convolution, check what numbers are above zero, and then we can simply use a NumPy Boolean and across the two uh, arrays of what's unrevealed and what has a low neighbor, and we'll get that set that's safe to click without any loops. It's a 10 times speed up, and of course, it's a strategy that's actually useful. So here again, I, I can't resist. I have to um, show that it's a useful strategy. There we go. Uh, it's a useful strategy and uh, runs quite quickly. Uh-oh. Oh, did we have one good demo and it wasn't even the good one? I'm gonna cry. Oh, no. So yeah, all of a sudden, it's actually capable of finding things and it solves, oh, it ran straight past the victory screen. Let's do it again. It takes only about five seconds compared to the few minutes that a seasoned player could uh, spend on it. Yeah, four seconds, there we go. Go, good job, script. <laughs> Of course, uh, it's not uh, perfect at this point by a long shot. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, res There's a brown grid there that's difficult to see. It's the normal mode, and it's the step up. Here, if you run the, um, if you run the script again, uh, you'll find that it can sometimes get fairly far, but there's just not enough info. As I mentioned earlier, the denser the monsters are, the more trouble it has and the more sophisticated strategies it needs. Yeah, see, can't actually get there. We're gonna need to be a little bit more sophisticated if we want to actually solve the game. Uh, and uh, skip the safety video, thank goodness. Of course, the question is, was this worth it? It was a lot of optimization for something that would have worked out of the box. And in fact, if you crunch the numbers, it's blocked by IO pretty heavily. A lot of the script is just spent clicking and taking the screenshot. Removing all of the strategy would only save 3%. 
So was it worth it? Yes, of course it was. I'm telling you that it's worth it in this whole talk. It's worth it because learning NumPy and Scikit is really important for later phases of the project. The, later, the strategies involve very sophisticated use of NumPy and some convolution things that are either really smart or really dumb. Feel free to check out my GitHub to see for yourself what you think. And of course, it's also a great way to learn in general. Experts on education call it just-in-time learning, and it changes convolution from something you learn in a class of blur or sharpen images to, oh, well, here's how it works, and here's how you can use it to help yourself. But we aren't learning to learn. We're learning to win. The third thing that kept me going through all of the bug fixing, all of the confusion, was glory. If you go to speedrun.com, you can find fast times to beat most video games, and Mama No Sweeper is not an exception. Uh, my goal from the beginning was to get the top time using my script on all versions. Uh, so you can see that the human times are pretty quick. Uh, we've already beaten the easy mode, but we can't come close on normal yet. And the huge X extreme, about 13 minutes. Uh, so let's give it a try, uh, see if we can beat the huge X extreme version. There's a lot of things to click, which is why it takes so long. And this is the uh, final version with more sophisticated uh, strategizing. It'll struggle too for a little bit. Again, it's limited by the amount of information available and visible. But I find that once it can get a foothold in one of the corners, it has a lot easier of a time. And what I'm really proud of here is that it goes through with strategies that I could describe to you in words. There's no black box, no AI under the hood shaping it to go one way or another. Uh, it's doing strategies that made sense to me and that I converted to code. It's also doing them pretty darn fast. We just finished in 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I am grateful that, that uh, the live demos worked with fewer headaches this time. Uh, grateful that I don't need the safety video here either. So as you can see, I ran them a bunch of times. I got my best times, everything down under 30 seconds. I felt like I really hit some major milestones, but of course, I know it's not perfect. The blind mode I mentioned has so little information, the script can only su succeed one out of 20 or even one out of 100 for the difficult mode. And I want to improve it still. Two strategies I see for this are either leveraging neural networks or some sort of statistics-based solver. The advantage of the neural network is that the training data is a piece of cake to use. It's already a grid of numbers. Neural networks love grids of numbers and it might be able to capture that intuition that a human player develops after playing enough time. Of course, why I haven't done this is I'm not very skilled at uh, AI stuff. I don't know how to make those inroads that let me succeed in the project as a whole. Meanwhile, the statistical solvers are basically guaranteed to work. When you see a number, there are various configurations that could result in that number, and some are more likely than others. If we compute all of the permutations, find which places are the least likely to have a dangerous monster, we can click there. It's hard, but it's guaranteed to work, and there's existing problems that are very similar, like the partitioning problem or constraint satisfaction, which you might know because those are actually NP-hard problems. And it's even worse than that. Uh, finite mi Minesweeper is NP-complete. If it's an infinite board, it is Turing-complete. Meaning, yes, you could play Minesweeper by seeing if you could play Minesweeper on an infinite grid, which is kind of horrifying. Of course, this scares me away from statistical solvers, but those only indicate classes of difficulty. In real life, hacking together a neural network or some statistical solver only has to be random chance to make my script better. And it always tempts me to come back We'll see for the future, but I don't feel bad about stalling out on the project when it's coming up against NP hard problems. And I hope that you had something to take away from this. Uh, of all things, this project was great for teaching me goal management. And every step, I could reframe the problem to be just a bit more difficult than I was capable of. And I could do that straight through to the end. 
Of course, the opportunities to learn were really excellent, and completing the goal felt undeniably great. And in your own projects, mind the uh, loop of MSS for screenshots, use OpenCV to parse the image, and PyAuto GUI to click, and you can do most things that you would at a computer. And this feels like a very logical place to end the presentation, but I can't shake a very unsettled feeling about this whole thing. Originally, I completed the script, did the last push to GitHub, November 16th, 2022, and I thought it was pretty cute. And then two weeks later to the day, ChatGPT had a general release and changed what we consider computers can do easily. Gen broadly speaking, the script looks at the computer, it thinks for a bit, and then it clicks based on where it thinks. And suddenly, that thinking step got a lot more interesting. Obviously, this can do anything that you can do at a computer. I'm not naive. This has some antisocial potential. Take, for example, Twitter's controversial decision to shut down its free API tier. Ostensibly, this will shut down a lot of evil botnets and good research projects, art projects, etc. But they can't eliminate the ability for a human to interact with the main page of Twitter to post a tweet. And as you all can imagine, it's easy to have that tweet generated to whatever the programmer wants. And you might be thinking, well, what about CAPTCHAs? And what about CAPTCHAs? This unnamed service that solves a CAPTCHA with a real human at the other end through an API endpoint wasn't hard to find. And that's on top of the really incredible research papers coming out where people are trying to do deep learning to beat CAPTCHA solving problems. So I think that, you know, unless you're doing it for something like account setup, like then it makes sense, but ultimately, people will get scared away if they have to complete a capture just to send a tweet. One solution that absolutely stopped me in my tracks was a complete redesign of the game. Two weeks before I was due to give this talk at uh, PyCon Taiwan, I found that the developer went back to this decade-old game and fixed it. It's a much better experience. Please check out the website. Of course, this ruined the image landmarks all the grid widths were suddenly dynamic, and worst of all, it no longer accepted clicks from Pi Auto GUI. I was panicking, trying my best to hack the script back together to make it work. And I found that the dev, after pressure on Twitter, not from me, put the old versions up on this website again. Which reminds us that even if you do something very drastic to get in the way of scripting, unwelcome scripting from outside parties, it's a setback, and it'll get pushback from the very real people who use whatever product you're trying to harden. Ultimately, it's a challenging topic. How do you stop you know, automated harassment, misinformation, bullying? Uh, as developers, I still think it's worth automating what we can. We have a position to get away some of the drudgery of life, some of unpleasant tasks, and I think we should try to do so. At the same time, we should do sensible checks where we should for whether someone is a human. I don't think it's unreasonable to put a CAPTCHA to make a new account on a website. And of course, we should do what we can to limit what a bad actor can do anyway. If there's a big red button and pressing it blows up the world, I don't care if it's a robot pressing it or a person pressing it, I don't want that to happen. I think there's more to be done to solve this problem as people. I think we should be kind to each other. I think we should foster communities with each other and make it so that when someone is hateful, spreads misinformation, bullies online, it stands out and we can shut it out, whether it is a person or a computer. Thank you so much for your time. I do have some time for questions. The common ones are, is this open source? Yes, please check out my GitHub page. It's jgall3 slash T-A-S-W-E-E-P-E-R. If you'd like to get in contact with me, my email, john.gall at hangay.com. My Twitter, or X, I guess, uh, at John Gool. Uh, we should be coworkers. We got a recruiting site. Check out the booth. Uh, and if you would rather read this presentation, there's a series of blog posts I wrote on Hengay's blog. You can feed it through a machine translation if you like. It should uh, work a lot better. So please, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them now.
Thank you for your presentation. If anyone, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. All right, thanks for the great talk, John. Uh, just one question. Has you ever found out what happened, why the Pi auto GUI doesn't, the click doesn't work anymore? A fantastic question. Uh, so I was really working. I managed to fix the landmarks issue, the grid widths issue, and I was just down to the clicking, exactly. And I think it's some underlying event listener that changed to where it required more of a delay between mouse down and mouse up. So by tuning that, I was able to get it to register clicks, but it wasn't nearly as fast. I think it might also have something to do with how it changed the rendering timing. Uh, for some reason, like whether it was a different size had some effect. Uh, it's actually a great question because it points out that to the computer, like a click is one thing. We don't, but to a human, we don't care about we don't care about what event happens. We press the button; it does the thing. Uh, exploiting that is honestly one of the best ways to prevent automation. Uh, but yes, thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about how you uh, define the pixel with. To uh, which pixel that you have to click, and then uh, how how you get that pixel? Because I have this kind of job that requires me to uh, clicking a lot of stuff. Uh, click this and then uh, write this. I know about the Python uh, UI. I have trying to do that, but there's this uh, event that it kind of dynamic, and I need to find some text and go to the text, and then I use that. So. I'm I'm still trying to figure out how can I find uh, the pixel location of the text so I can write something and I can click something based on that. A fantastic question. Uh, side note: If anyone automates their job without telling their boss, please <laughs> tell me on Twitter. I am going to be so thrilled for you. Uh, but this is where OpenCV actually comes in really handy. So I mentioned this match template function where you provided a reference image and then you check in a larger image. It doesn't give you a Boolean. It gives you a field of probabilities. So if it's pixel art, it's very easy to get almost 100%. But depending on the situation, you might be able to give a very close approximation that's 70% correct and still looks where you're looking for. Uh, additionally, if there was a way to dynamically render what pixels you need to make that reference image ahead of time, I think that would be a really interesting way to tackle this problem. Uh, although, yeah, it does point out the fact that this game is pixel art makes it a lot easier. Thank you. Can, can I have a follow-up question? Oh, please. So, uh, you sometimes that we need to find text, not uh, so there are a lot of text that I need to find, and then uh, if we if we look at this reference, it landmark, so it's not a text that we already get the image. So, uh, do you do you think that OpenCV can handle that? OpenCV alone can handle that. We need to search this text. We need to search this text. Uh, OpenCV alone, I don't think could handle that. If it's searching within a web page, I would recommend something like Beautiful Soup that takes the whole HTML and just gives it to you as a searchable string. Oh, there we go. Uh, gives it to you as a searchable string. I think that might get more to what you're looking for here. Alternatively, I think if you could, in a controlled environment, feed the text in and format it and then take a screenshot of that, then you would have the reference image that OpenCV could do. But I don't know if it can just find this string in a picture image. Am I understanding correctly? Yeah, 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 okay, okay. I understand, maybe uh, because it's not yet, maybe that's gonna be our job that I think I'm gonna try to create something to solve the problems. Thank you. Sounds good, thank you. And let me know about your progress. I'd love to hear about it. Sure, sure, I'm gonna share it to you. 
as a question. Yes, sir, just one more question. Um, anywhere you want to take this further? Oh my God, I alternate between wanting to do more on this and never touch it again. Uh, but every time I come to the slide about solving it with statistics or a neural network, I'm always like, well, it's not that much of a trap to try this. Surely it's like a one day thing to at least get a testable solution up and running. Uh, and I think once I had that testable thing, uh, a way of testing whether a strategy actually improved objectively versus subjectively, I think that would be a great next step that I could reasonably do, maybe after this PyCon season. <laughs> Thank you. Um, have you thought of reaching out to the creator of the game to collaborate on using what you've made to do some sort of testing so they can automate against what you're trying to achieve, which would be cool, <laughs> and to not let other people have so much fun by oh. exploiting it, if that makes sense. Uh, I mean, part of what I find exciting about this project is that it's something that the original author of any system can't get in the way of as effectively because it is just interacting with the game the way the game wants to be interacted with. It gets clicks, it doesn't care about how fast they are, but honestly the redesign has slowed me down so much and slowed down the clicking especially. I think the dev has honestly done a good job unintentionally of blocking this. Although I did reach out and say I really enjoyed his game. Thank awesome. you. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, uh, for time limitation, so la last question please. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk, John. And I think it's not a question, just an idea. Uh, yesterday morning, there's a keynote talk uh, talking about uh, uh, Python programming education in uh, University of Kyoto. So I just thought about maybe your kind of this uh, project can be put into some sort of steps and put into the, his book as a kind of another kind of tutorial or some sort of coding uh, idea. That would be really interesting. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, just delightful if this, of all things, wound up in a college textbook. <laughs> Thank you so much, though. Thank you for many questions. And I, I accessed the TAS repository, and I start a very, very nice repository, and I found a slide, slide. So and let's access this repository. <laughs> so uh, the time is up. We will have to end it here. Thank you very much for your talk. Everybody, please give a big round of applause to the speaker.